All right, History 363. So this week we are going to be talking about Rome's conquest of Italy. And then next week we will be talking about Rome's Republican institutions. Um, so we left off um, uh, in, in talking about the struggle of the orders. We talked about the capture of Vey, um, which isn't all that big of a deal. Vey is 12 miles away. But from the perspective of the relatively modest Roman city-state, it's a very big deal. Um, uh, it sees a major advance in how war is financed with the introduction of stipendium. It doubles the size of Roman territory, of the Agor Romanus, and the distribution of land that's taken from Ve um, allows more men to be able to serve potentially in the Roman army now that they're given plots. And indeed, land distribution of captured land is going to be an important way that Rome in the Middle Republic both uh, uh, lessens potential social problems um, and also in, uh, increases and augments its military manpower. Um, now, I mentioned that in 390 BC, Rome suffers an incredible defeat, the capture and sack of the city by the Gauls, um, who leave when the Romans pay a ransom. Um, and in the aftermath of the defeat, uh, the Romans undertake a massive public building project. Um, in 378, they throw up a huge circuit wall. It's made out of tufa stone um, that is taken from Vey. Um, it's quarried uh, in, in Veian territory. Um, and this is, a, this is an extraordinarily extensive project. Um, Rome had had some old fortifications. Um, which are largely lar uh, huge uh, earthen ramparts that are faced with stone. Um, but this is actually a solid stone wall built. Uh, really, this reflects the most up-to-date um, Greek wall building technology. Um, uh, we know from maker's marks on the stones that it's likely that some Greek craftsmen were involved because there are Greeks, Greek letters on some of, the, uh, some of the stones. And it's a huge investment in resources. Um, uh, it's partially funded through tributum. Um, some of the labor may be kind of corvée labor, forced, forced labor from the citizen body. Um, but this is, this is an extraordinary undertaking for the city-state. Um, and indeed, we hear that uh, it actually causes um, the plebs in part to suffer from debt issues because they're spending more time building the wall than working on their farm. Um, so this is the largest circuit wall in Italy and one of the largest circuit walls in the entire Mediterranean, um, now actually providing a complete defense of the city of Rome. Um, and it's, I think, a sign of just how shaken the Romans were by this Gallic sack um, that reminded them of the vulnerability of the city, which they're now trying to remedy. Um, so uh, uh, the Serbian Wall is probably the most um, prominent kind of military response to the Gallic sack. Um, uh, it's actually, I think, about seven miles all around in the circuit. That's a lot of tufa stone. Um, uh, that said, uh, the event that is likely going to really turn the Romans from being um, uh, kind of just trying to hold the line, just trying to maintain their territory, to being a conquest state, are the political reforms um, of the uh, Licinian Sextian laws. Um, again, uh, the fact that on one hand you have attempts to uh, improve the lot of common plebeians, of course, those continue down the course of the, of the fourth century. The Lex Poitilia, um, uh, with the publication of the um, uh, uh, Legis Actiones, um, with the, the uh, affirmation of the right of provocatio. All of this is going to in improve the standing of common citizens, the military manpower that makes the legions. Um, and equally importantly, the creation of a truly competitive aristocracy, the fact that plebeians are granted access to the consulship in 367, and that access is guaranteed. The, in, in 342, a law is passed, the Lex Genusia, that says one consulship must go to a plebeian. Um, so again, the patricians have to up their game um, uh, because uh, they're now competing with the plebeians. Plebeians, plebeian families who are gaining the consulship are trying to establish little family dynasties because they want their son and their grandson to be consul. 
and the way that plebeians are, are uh, trying to establish dynasties is through aggressive military action. Of course, the patricians in upping their game were also more likely to engage in aggressive military action. So it's notable that after this big reform, we start seeing Rome turn into a conquest state in the latter part of the fourth century BC. A lot of it seems to be that this, the, the, the introduction of the plebeians into the Roman aristocracy makes the aristocracy so much more competitive. Um, now, uh, the sort of, uh, if we sort of step back, so far we've been facing the Romans off a number of kind of local enemies, Etruscans to the north, Volscans to the south, um, uh, uh, the Aequi uh, uh, and Hernici uh, who are kind of to the east. Um, and again, largely this has kind of been a stalemated, with the exception of the capture of Vey, this has been a kind of stalemated. The Romans hold the line, but no big conquest, and, and don't really ever seem to be truly able to crush or dominate um, these enemies. Um, now, that being said, the uh, prior to this, prior, I mean, prior to the middle of the 4th century BC, the most expansionary people in Italy aren't the Romans, but a group of people who live in the Apennine Mountains called the Samnites. Um, the Samnites speak a language that belongs, it's, it's part of the broader Italic family, but uh, uh, modern linguists call it Oscan. Um, so it's, it's related to Latin, probably maybe a little bit intelligible, but mostly mutually unintelligible. Um, so the, the Samnites are Oscan speakers. They live in the highlands. They, they do not have state structures. Um, the Samnites are a coalition of four tribes, the tribes themselves are an assemblage of districts, uh, uh, cantons called uh, uh, Pegi. So that's eventually way down the line where we get our term pagan for people who live in a Pegus, a sort of country rural district. Um, so the Christians are calling pagans sort of country bumpkins. Um, uh, so the Samnites don't have a, 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 a centralized state, but they have a loose confederacy of these four tribes. Um, uh, uh, a, a central sort of focus of that confederacy is a joint mountain sanctuary, um, uh, Pietro Bodante, um, and, um, uh, uh, which, which is sort of a cult center. Um, but they do have the ability to raise armies from across uh, Samnium and elect generals from across Samnium to engage in campaigns, even, again, even if, again, there is no centralized Samnite state. Um, and Expansion by the Samnites is also decentralized. Um, the Samnites don't expand by, by coming out, you know, go, coming together and saying we're going to conquer over yonder. Instead, the mode of expansion, at least as we're told by our sources, is informal. That is, when a, uh, a, 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 a pagus or when a, when a tribe feels like there's too much population, and their current ecosystem is overrun. Remember, these folks live up at the highlands, so um, uh, there are mountain you know, fields and pastures, but they're, they're much more delicate and much more restricted. So you might really get a sense of, hey, there's, there's too many people for the carrying capacity of, of this immediate habitat. Um, they vote to do something called a sacred spring, in that all of the children born uh, in a, a, a certain period are... Um, dedicated to the gods, they're raised up to adulthood, and then once they reach adulthood, they have to, to they sort of are formed into a, a sort of mobile army, warriors and, uh, and their uh, 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 families, or, or the, the, the women as well. And, and the same might say, guess what? You're the sacred spring. You have to go conquer your own land. You have to leave. Um, and then this group... Um, will go and uh, it, try to expand somewhere else, try to settle somewhere else. Now, my guess is things don't work as neatly as this, but it does seem that, that what you actually have is, again, rather than centralized expansion, or it's, you, you, you have groups of Samnites spinning off from regions that are hitting their, their population carrying capacity and trying to settle elsewhere, elsewhere in the Apennine Mountains, and also raiding down, and not just raiding, but settling, um, down into the coastal plains. Um, and so the Samnites are therefore, uh, 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 at this point, uh, control of a big swath of the Apennines Mountains, and they're raiding in, uh, the, the coastal plain that they're really raiding into is Campania. This is some of the best agricultural land um, 
uh, in, in Italy, remember. Um, now, in 343, the Campani, the, the people who live in Campania, hard-pressed by Samnite uh, raids and settlements, um, uh, call on the Romans for help. And the Romans agree to aid the Campani against the Samnites. And this leads to the short, brief First Samnite War a war that is actually very poorly attested in our sources. Um, you will sometimes hear a theory that the First Samnite War didn't actually happen, that the Romans invented it. I, I don't, that's unconvincing. It may be that some details of the First Samnite War were invented because the Romans didn't know that much about it. It may be that some incidents from the Second Samnite War were sort of Retro, you know, retrojected into similar incidents that are, that are told about the First Samnite War. But I don't think there's any reason not to believe that the First Samnite War existed. Um, and it's, it's basically a draw. The, the Romans and Samnites fight for a while, and then the Romans say, you know, guys, kind of leave our good friends that come to the Campania alone, we'll, we'll, be, we'll be fine. Um, and there's one reason why the Romans may be less interested in aggressively um, uh, uh, finishing this war is they suffer um, uh, in 341 a revolt of the Latin allies who are to the south. So again, uh, south of Rome are roughly 20 or so Latin communities. They speak the same language as the Romans. They have a lot in common culturally. Um, and they form what is um, probably kind of an informal league uh, uh, of, of Latin communities, sometimes referred to as the Latin League, um, where they share a common cult site um, uh, in, near the Alban Hills. Um, they come together and have an annual festival, the Latin Festival. Um, and they also have some kind of reciprocal rights. So if you're a citizen in one Latin town, including Rome, you can kind of move, to, you can trade citizenships, moving from one town to another. Um, and, uh, and so that's nice. It allows for some mobility. Again, many of these Latin communities are, are much, much smaller than Rome. They may only be a couple thousand people. So it's nice if you can move to a neighboring community, automatically get citizenship there, move back to your old community, regain your citizenship there. Um, they also have the right of intermarriage with one another, connubium. So if you want to marry a woman in the town over, no problem. You can, you can marry her and your offspring can be recognized as legitimate by people in both communities. Um, and it's likely they also have some reciprocal commercial rights, recognizing each other's uh, commercial law, commercium. Um, so uh, the Latins have a lot in common, but um, in 341, there, there, there is some kind of strain in the relationships. The Latins, perhaps kind of alarmed with the you know, aggressiveness that the Romans are acting now, uh, you know, fighting a, a big sort of war with the Samnites, uh, 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 represents a level of assertiveness that the Romans and up till now haven't really demonstrated. Um, so the Latins formed their own coalition with uh, uh, the Campanians, who actually have been a little alarmed by the way the, the Romans kind of leave them in the lurch, um, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, some other peoples in the, in the south. Um, and uh, there is a brisk war. Um, again, our details are bad. Uh, but suffice it to say, the Romans win a crushing victory. They crush the Latins and the Campanians and the Volscians. And this leads to a radical reordering of what Central Italy looks like um, uh, uh, at the end of the Latin War in 338. Um, uh, most critically, almost all of the old Latin towns, save for uh, three that had not revolted, are directly annexed into Rome. That is, the Latins are, are absorbed into the Roman citizen body. They literally, and it's, again, this is actually sort of a punishment, right? That whatever political community you had at Lavinium or Lanuvium or um, uh, is now gone. Um, you, your town, uh, it, you, are, you are now simply a citizen of Rome, and you can, uh, you know, the only politics you can take part in are now Roman politics. Um, so this dramatically increases the size of the citizen body. Um, and of course, this is a little exploitative as well. Now the Latins have to serve in Roman armies. Now the Latins have to pay tributum, the war tax. Um, it's obviously also going to make Rome a much more powerful city-state. Um, and of course, eventually many of these Latin communities will be pretty 
happy as Roman communities. Their elites will enter into um, the Roman nobility, um, and uh, uh, you know, in the long run, it works pretty well for them. You might say, but in the short term, you might say this this annexation, this enfranchisement, is actually a bit of a punishment. Um, uh, so also, in Fran also annexed are um, most of the, a number of companion communities. Um, Unlike the Romans, they are annexed as citizens without the vote. So they are given sort of Roman franchise, but they're not allowed to vote in Roman elections. In another video, we will talk about the, the details of sort of ver the various statuses that the Romans give to their Italian allies. But suffice it to say, this actually seems to be a moment when the Romans start experimenting with different gradations of citizenship and uh, uh, how it can be used to control the people that Rome has conquered. Um, so again, this is, this is uh, Rome now emerges as this radically enlarged power in Central Italy. And note, remember the Romans have been fighting the Volscians um, uh, for the last you know, 150 years. They've just been crushed. They've been crushed along with the companions and the Latins. This is how kind of thoroughly things are changing um, now that Rome kind of is becoming an aggressive expansionary power, having solved a lot of its social problems. You might say it's kind of like the sleeping giant, gets its act together, and then all of a sudden um, uh, is, is kind of unstoppable. Um, now, the Romans do provoke another war with the Samnites. Uh, this time it seems to be its Roman expansionism, the Romans founding a colony, Frigalli, um, uh, in the Lyris Valley, um, that leads to conflict with the, with, the, with the Samnites and leads to the second Samnite War from 326 to 304 BC. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, Roman colonization uh, is, is actually a really important aspect of how the Romans are going to come to control Italy. We'll talk about that more in another video and sort of think about the, the, the nature, the infrastructure of Roman domination. Um, but su suffice it to say, um, it, th that's one thing that sparks a war, and colonization is going to be another sort of steady theme of as the Romans win victories, the way they solidify those victories is through putting down colonies. Um, and of course, those colonies also benefit Rome, right? They, if you have, again, the problem of, oh, population is growing, uh, uh, people, um, uh, you know, the, the people are su suffering from land hunger, uh, families are outgrowing their family farm. Well, taking, you know, one son off that farm and putting him in a colony solves your social problems, gives you more military manpower, and allows you to control a defeated Italian uh, uh, region with that colony as a kind of a permanent garrison. Um, so anyway, the Second Samnite War is sparked in 326, um, and the Romans early on do not do very well. Indeed, one of the more memorable Roman military disasters comes at the Battle of Caudine Forks, um, 321 BC, um, where a Roman army is lured into a, uh, a, a sort of narrow, steep terrain, is surrounded all around by, uh, by a Samnite army and is compelled to surrender. Um, and the Samnites do the worst possible thing that you can do to a Roman soldier. They don't kill them, they don't enslave them. Rather, they, they force them to pass under the yoke. That is, they uh, set up three spears um, and uh, in, in a way um, that in order to pass through the, 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 the spear, the, the, sorry, the horizontal spear, um, you have to kneel down. Um, and uh, they're stripped of their arms and armor and are only wearing a, a tunic. And then one by one, they have to bow while the Samnites watch and laugh and make fun of this. And to the, to the Romans, and probably to the Italians, this is the most humiliating thing you can do to a defeated enemy, degrade them by forcing them to one by one pass under the yoke, and then say, get the hell out and go home. Um, now, you might say from hindsight, this doesn't work. The Romans, rather than being humiliated and never wanting to fight again, are instead really angry, um, and they keep up the war, um, uh, 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 sending ar army after army uh, uh, year after year. Um, by and large, the gains of the Second Samnite War 
um, are they, the Romans have no territorial gains vis-a-vis -vis the Samnites. What they do have are diplomatic gains in that in the Romans, in showing that they can move armies across uh, and, and into Samnite territory, and also showing that they can move armies into the territory of adjacent regions, gain a number of allies, people who, whether they want to or not, are realizing that they're going to have to pick and choose between the Samnites and the Romans, and seeing that, gosh, you know, the Romans can put an army in Apulia, and a number of Apulian communities ally with Rome. They're, they're impressed and maybe a little terrified um, by that. Um, the Romans also uh, uh, obtain another number of allies of the Abruzzi people um, who live to the north of the Samnites, the Pelagni and Marsi, um, who may be a little worried about the Samnites expanding up towards them. And when they see that the Romans can reliably move armies across Italy, um, they, they form that alliance. So in some ways, the, the Second Samnite War sees the Samnites not defeated, but contained um, uh, through a kind of alliance system. Um, and again, also, uh, the Romans during the Second Samnite War work on building physical infrastructure, most notably the Via Appia. This is the first major Roman road, which initially connects Rome to Capua, Capua being the largest, uh, most important city in Campania. It's subsequently going to be expanded to go all the way to Brindisium, the major Roman military fort. But, it, but now it just goes to, to Capua. Um, but that's nonetheless very important because what that means is the Romans now have a f easy means to move troops down, uh, uh, down towards the south, which can then subsequently move against the Samnites. And, and so even though, again, the Romans um, uh, don't take territory away from the Samnites, and indeed the, the actual peace is kind of one of equality, they now have a network of alliances that surround the Samnites, and they now are, are having physical infrastructure that will allow them to project power against the Samnites. Um, now, the peace doesn't hold. And you know, one thing that I, you know, we, we historians in the modern period start referring to these as the First Samnite War, the Second Samnite War, the Third Samnite War. Um, the Romans don't think about it that way. They think about this as the Samnite War, the whole thing being a long, ongoing war against the Samnites, which sees uh, periods of intensification and some lulls, um, but the, the kind of classifications are, are that I'm giving you, First, Second, Third, those are modern. Um, the Third Samnite War uh, is reignited in 298, um, and this is um, uh, the probably most desperate and intensive of all of the wars. The, the Samnites um, seem to kind of realize that, the, that if they don't do anything, um, Rome is going to be un, unstoppable. They probably are feeling the kind of containment efforts. Um, and of course, they also are perhaps realizing, as they feel around diplomatically, that there's some other groups in Italy who aren't necessarily... Uh, completely happy with the idea of Roman domination. So they, the, what happens is the Samnites produce a grand anti-Roman coalition, um, and that is going to include Etruscan communities. Um, during, this, you know, during this time, the Romans have been fighting um, campaigns against the Etruscan cities to the north as well as against the Samnites. The Etruscans are feeling, um, at times, somewhat under pressure. Um, uh, uh, so, so uh, Etruscan communities, Umbrian communities, the Umbrians live in the Apennines, uh, uh, kind of uh, to, the, to the west of the Etruscans, um, and also a number of Cisalpine Gauls, um, who, if anything, are, you know, some, sometimes are simply kind of mercenaries. So this is a big coalition, Gauls, Etruscans, Umbrians, and Samnites, um, and it also means that whereas the Second Samnite War had largely been fought in kind of south-central Italy, or around Samnium. The Third Samnite War is truly a kind of uh, Italian war. Um, uh, now, the grand, uh, the, the, the fact that this coalition puts together a, a huge combined army um, is going to test Rome's ability to mobilize its manpower. Um, the big decisive battle, the, the war will actually continue on, but the big decisive Slice of battle, the battle that ultimately breaks up this coalition, comes at Centinum uh, in 295 BC, in which the uh, both Roman consular armies, um, uh, uh, Roman consular armies, we'll talk next week, is about 20,000 men, two legions, and two wings of allies. Um, 
uh, two consular armies, perhaps aided by a third, so the, the Romans may have upwards of around 60,000 men. Um, they confront this big coalition army. A great battle ensues, about which our sources are terrible, um, but the Romans win. And indeed, the, the, the story they tell is largely not a story of sort of maneuvers or tactics um, or key command decisions. It's a story of religion, uh, namely that the Roman consul, um, uh, uh, whose uh, name is um, uh, Moose, uh, the, the, the mouse, um, um, decides to engage in uh, something called uh, a devotio, um, in which he is going to devote himself. He, he may, this ritual may be perhaps made up for the occasion. Um, he's going to devote himself by plunging into the enemy in a way that he's certainly going to be killed, having first pledged himself to the thonic gods, the gods uh, beneath the earth, um, and in exchange, he will the, the, in exchange for his sacrifice, um, he, the Romans will achieve um, victory. And so, uh, this is uh, th this is this main story that the Romans tell about the Battle of Centinum. Um, you know, frankly, I would also like to know some more of the military details in a kind of reliable way. Um, but we do know this is a big battle. Perhaps involves probably involves upwards of a hundred thousand soldiers on both sides. Um, and in many ways, with this victory and the shattering of the Samnites coalition, um, uh, Roman hegemony over Italy is going to be assured, at least in the near term. Um, there are still about five more years of conflict as the Romans sort of mop up. Um, but the end of the third Samnite war um, sees Rome as the dominant power in Italy. And notably, one of the ways that the Romans cement that is through more colonization, putting a ring of colonies around the Samnites um, to keep them down. So at any rate, we will talk more. Uh, next time we'll actually talk about the infrastructure of control, how the Romans actually control central Italy after they've won the battle. Um, uh, so have a uh, safe Labor Day holiday, and we'll talk more soon.